I feel like a lot of people are not very keen on surprises. Uh, they say life comes at you fast, and oftentimes there are things that happen in our life that completely blindsides us. It uh, distracts us, it takes our eyes off of the prize, and we really weren't expecting what happens in those moments. Every so often, uh, going out to eat is um, an interesting chore for me because I, I'm torn between the safe and familiar and trying to try something new. You know, so for example, um, I, I've recently fallen in love with a very specific sandwich. Um, it's, a, it's called a scorpion sandwich, which scorpions are weird and creepy to me, but it has scorpion cheddar cheese. And I don't know if you've ever had scorpion cheddar cheese, but wow, is it hot, like crazy hot. I mean, when I read the description of the sandwich, it said, this is a sandwich, it's got this type of cheese, and it's, a, it's, it's spicy. And I think to myself, okay, I like a little bit of spice, and so I think I would like to try it, knowing that I've had very spicy things before. And so I take the bite of the sandwich, and you know, it's, it's really good. The ham is good, the, the cheese is nice and, and thick, and there's a little bit of spice when you first bite into it. And I'm thinking, okay, that's not so bad. And then all of a sudden, the, the flavor amps in my mouth get cranked straight to 11. And my mouth and my lips are tingling. And I'm like, I was not expecting this. It was so very hot, but it's so good. And, and I, can't, I can't explain it, I can't describe it other than this is not what I was expecting. This is something completely different, but now I'm absolutely in love with it. I'm, I'm enthralled with it. It was the same way when I first tried um, ranch on chicken for the first time. You know, growing up as a child, the go-to condiment for chicken was ketchup. And it wasn't until I was adult, uh, until I was an adult that I tried a little bit of ranch with chicken, and I thought to myself, I have wasted so many years of my life because I didn't understand it. I have a friend of mine who lives in, in Washington State, and he is very adamant that pineapple goes on pizza. I disagree with that. I, I vehemently disagree with that. And, and he swears up and down, no, it's good, you'll love it, you should try it. And I said, I will only try it if you ever come to visit, if we're ever together, you know, I will try the pineapple pizza. And he assures me one day this is going to happen. And I don't know what's going to happen when I try pineapple pizza for the first time. I, I might be pleasantly surprised. You see, here's the thing, like, we as people, we don't necessarily like to be surprised. We like to have things predictable. We like to have things planned out. And so when we read in Mark, in chapter 10, when we look at our reading for today, we see a lot of unexpected things happen. We see a lot of strange answers to questions. It starts off very simply enough that Jesus is going on a journey, and a man runs up to him and kneels before him. Good teacher, he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, this is something that everybody wonders. Everybody wants to know, what must I do? What rules do I have to follow to find favor? Do what, what, what do I have to do to be good enough so that I can have eternal life? And this man recognizes Jesus. He says, good teacher. And instantly, Jesus gives a very strange answer. You see, his answer doesn't necessarily fit with what we expect to happen. The first, words out of, were out, the first words out of his mouth are not, this is what you need to do. But he poses a question to him. Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Now, now certainly we understand that human beings are prone to sin. We understand that people have a natural inclination to sin, to do things the wrong way. We try desperately not to, but nine times out of ten again, we will still wind up uh, sinning. We'll still wind up failing. 
And if you think that you're good and proper and you can follow the rules, my favorite example of uh, if you think you can follow the rules is hypothetically you walk into a room and you see a sign on the wall and the sign says, wet paint, don't touch. Your first inclination is to touch the wall that you were literally just told not to do. To break a rule, a, a simple rule, and you can justify it all you want. Well, I needed to see if it was wet, I needed to move this, I needed to move that. But the sign says, don't touch. And our natural inclination is to ignore that sign and to do it anyway. Now, why does Jesus point this out? He says, no one is good but God alone. He's like, so why are you calling me good? It's almost as if Jesus is testing this man right from the beginning. See, he doesn't get a, a simple answer. He's, he's checking to see, okay, your heart's in the right place. You want to know what you must do to obtain eternal life. But what do you know? Because certainly we know that Jesus is the divine Son of God. We worship a triune God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So it's possible Jesus is asking him and trying to see, do you know exactly who it is you're talking to? But then he gives the answer. He says, you know the commandments. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie. Honor your mom and dad. He says, you know the rules. You know exactly how it is you're supposed to behave. And, and for us, that's, that's what we do. You know, we know what we're supposed to do. We understand. We have read the scripture. We know the rules. We know we're supposed to love everybody. We know we're supposed to love God. We know we're not supposed to kill people. We know we're not supposed to murder people. We know all of these things. And this guy, his response is, Teacher, I have kept all of these since my youth. All of the big ones. He says, I've done this. Jesus, looking at him, he loved him. He felt compassion for him. He says, this guy gets it. He understands, he, you know, he says he understands how he's supposed to act. And he's so close. He's so very close, and he says, you lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, come follow me. And the guy is completely blindsided by this. This is not the answer he wanted to hear. He wanted something easy. He, maybe, maybe he wanted a, a, a that -a boy. You know, you're doing good, kid. You got this. Maybe that's what he wanted. He wanted something he could take and hold on to and say, I've, I've done this. And Jesus takes his question and takes it one step further. He says, sell everything you have. Give it away to the poor and follow me. And the man hears this, and he is distraught. He is brokenhearted. He is sad. He was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. It was not the answer that this guy wanted. Oftentimes in our lives, we get answers that we don't necessarily like. We have things happen in our lives that we dislike. We have things happen in our lives that we don't want to deal with. We ask God for guidance, and God gives us the guidance, but we don't like it. It's like, you know what happens when you're driving with a GPS device, and it says, turn left up ahead, and you're like, I'm going right. Right. It gets all mad and frustrated and says, well, now I have to recalculate. And you feel as if you've just let this robot down. You know, we know what we're supposed to do. But there are often times we think we know better. There are often times when we say to ourselves, we want to do this our way. And we think we can do it on our own. 
Jesus looks and says to the disciples how hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of heaven. And they're all very confused by this. It's not necessarily an indictment on the rich. What it is is an indictment on the materialism that has pervaded people since the beginning of time. That we like our stuff. We like our things. We like our things so much that you can buy extra space outside of your home to store things that you don't have space for in your home. We get so attached to things. We get so busy and, and building idols out of these things. Sometimes the, the search for wealth, the search for power becomes this sort of all-consuming vortex, this black hole in our lives. And that becomes what we want to do, that we have to be first. We have to keep winning no matter what. We don't care about the consequences, and we will do whatever it takes to do that. How hard will it be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples are confused. Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. So Jesus goes to clarify at this point. It's not just for the wealthy, but in general, it's very hard to enter the kingdom of God. It's a straight and narrow path that not many people walk through or can walk through. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. A very famous line. And we have to wonder exactly what is Jesus talking about? An actual needle? And an actual camel? I mean, I've, I've ridden a camel before. When I was younger, uh, my parents took uh, my sister and I to the Columbus Zoo and they paid for us to ride a camel. It's very weird riding a giant camel. And they're very, very big. And you would think riding a camel, I mean, logically it can't go through the eye of the needle, but what this is pointing to is a gate, the needle's gate. And it was called that because it was a very small gate. And it's not that the camel couldn't get through, it's just it was a pain to get the camel to go through. The camel had to go down on his knees and sort of crawl through on his knees. And a lot of times, camels were used to, to carry things because they're able to carry a load. Because they're big and because they're kind of bulky, they can carry a load. So you have all these bags on the camel. You know, people didn't have minivans. They didn't have SUVs that they could load up. So they load everything on the camel when they're trying to move things. And because that gate was so small, what they would have to do is get off the camel, take everything off the camel get the camel to get on its knees, get the camel to sort of scoot on through, on its knees, through the thing, wait, have the camel wait there, go back through, and carry the things over. A long, involved, hard process. You know, people wonder why um, fast food is so popular. You know, and it's because of the convenience. It's easier for us to order a pizza. It's easier for us to run to McDonald's or run to Wendy's and, and pick up food because we don't have to cook it. Because if you're going to cook something, you know, you have to preheat the oven or you have to get all the ingredients out and you have to spend time and you have to do it. And it is so, so much easier for us to just buy something like right then and there. To have our, in, our immediate wants met instead of putting a little bit of effort into it. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. Giving up of yourself. Doing that which is hard, not because you want to necessarily, not because you find it very fun or this, that, and the other thing, but you do it because it's the right thing to do. Oftentimes when I'm building things, when I'm building a TV stand or a bookcase, someone, and nine times out of ten, it's not my wife, 
but someone, you know, sometimes it is, um, they'll complain that it's taking long. You know, why are, you know, it's very simple. It shouldn't take this long. And, and I'm like, you're right. It is very simple to do, but I have to make sure that it's right. If this is going to have, have any sort of weight, if this is going to be sturdy enough, I have to make sure I take my time. I have to follow the instructions because if I mess up, it's going to be catastrophic. So my question is, do you want it done right or do you want it done quickly? And that's how we have to think about things. Do we as Christians want to do that which is right, or do we want the quick, easy fix? Do we want to be able to say, I'm good, I don't have to worry about anything else, and not really be okay? Or do we want to have this deep, blessed assurance in our souls that we are following God Almighty? Peter says to him, we have left everything and we have followed you. Jesus said, truly, I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers, and he just lists all these things, who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this age. Many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Jesus is nothing if not countercultural to the ideas. We have these notions in our mind that we have to be the best. We have to be the biggest. We have to be the loudest. We have to be wonderful peacocks that show off everything about us. And we don't necessarily have to be the best. What we have to do is exactly what God tells us to do, to love God, to follow God, to spend time with God, to be in communion with God. And the, disciples, and the disciples, they understand this, that if it's very hard to obtain salvation. If this is what we must do to inherit eternal life, they ask him, then who can be saved? Because we can't do that on our own. Giving up everything to follow God, it makes no sense. And it, it makes no sense to us because we have to make sure things are taken care of. We, we say, you know, let's be logical here. We can't just give up everything. What will we do for food? What will we do for this? What will we do for that? How is it that we're going to be able to live if we give up everything? We can't do it. And we, we rationalize, we use logic, and we say to ourselves, we can't do this because of this. And so we are in the same spot as, as the disciples. If this is what you have to do, then who can be saved? And Jesus' response moves mountains. For mortals, it is impossible. He says, you know what? You're absolutely right. You can't do it. You will never be able to do it. If you are a human being, you are not going to be able to do this. But not for God. For God, all things are possible. Telling the disciples right then and there, look, you don't want to worry about salvation? You don't want to worry about eternal life? Leave it up to God. Because he has taken care of it. Many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. I did a wonderful uh, experiment at church camp once when I was a counselor. I was standing with the director, and it was time to go in for dinner. And uh, everyone was apparently starving because, you know, they didn't have snack or lunch or breakfast, apparently. And so they were jostling for position. They were fighting. They were pushing. They were shoving. And they were, you know, trying to get in there first. Because you get in there first, you get the good seat. And you get the good seat, that means you get the pick of the bug juice. And everyone wants red bug juice. Nobody wants that purple stuff. They want the red bug juice. So they will fight and hem and haw to make sure they get that juice. And so they were pushing and shoving. And I looked at the director. I said, hey, do you mind if I do something here? And he said, yeah, go for it. And I said, all right, guys, we're going to wait until we're quiet before we go in. Like, y'all are hungry. I get it. So we're going to wait to be quiet. So they settled themselves. They got quiet. They stood there. And they were waiting. And they were waiting. And so then I walked from the front of the line to the back. 
And I said, you guys weren't fighting. You guys weren't pushing. So we're going to enter in from the back. And we had everyone turn around and we looped around to go into the mess hall that way. We don't have to be first just because we think we'll get the best. What God wants us to do is to live humbly, to walk humbly with one another, to love one another. What must I do to inherit eternal life, O Lord? And the answer is nothing. Because you can't earn it. It's not something that you can do. It's something that God has given us out of his love. But that's not the answer we expect. We, we say, no, this makes no sense. We have to be able to do something because no one gives away anything just for free. But God did. And God does. The free gift of his salvation, given to us out of his great love. Thanks be to God for this gift. Amen.